Every time you go shopping, be it for groceries, shoes, clothes, iPods, or toys, one thing remains the same. More likely than not, you will carry your purchases to your car and into your home in a plastic bag. But while the experience is the most integral in the life of the plastic bag, it is far from the whole story. Before your groceries were placed inside, where did the bag come from? After you put your new clothes in the drawer, where does the bag go? That is what we intend to show in the life of the plastic bag from production to decomposition. First, we must go back to where this all started, when a Swedish man named Sten Gustav Tullen came up with the idea for a lightweight and durable bag made from plastics. Then in 1965, the celloplast company of Norrköping, Sweden, patented the new product. Due to the bag's chemical composition of petrochemicals, the U.S. company Mobil saw the need and overturned the patent in 1977. But the plastic craze would not begin until 1982, when two of America's largest grocery chains, Safeway and Kroger, agreed to use the bags and test the innovation. It ended up being a hit. And the use of the bags continued to increase through the 1990s and on through today. The main reason they caught on is their low cost and ease to produce. Due to these facts, it is estimated that over 80% of the U.S. grocery and convenience store uses plastic bags. And every year, the United States uses over 100 million plastic bags, which would require about an estimated 12 million barrels of crude oil to produce. And it is with that resource that the commodity chain of the plastic bag begins. Plastic is made from crude oil. To obtain the oil, rigs are built off the coasts of many nations, including the United States. Workers are paid to lower a drill under the body of water and then pump the oil into tanks to which they will be shipped. The workers on these rigs perform the bluest of blue-collar labor. Since the pumps are never turned off, these workers operate in shifts of a few full days on and a full day off the rig. Most entry-level jobs don't require much of a formal education. Usually the worker is trained on the job. Entry-level positions pay from $45,000 to $60,000 a year. However, many rig advocates would point to the steep increase in salary after experience is gained through entry-level work. The danger here has been felt just recently. When working with flammable material, there always is a risk of fire or explosion or spill. Environmentally, the risks are great as well. The recent massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico is in another example of the potential dangers of drilling. Our top story at the bottom of the hour, cleanup crews are working furiously to try to prevent major environmental damage from the Gulf Coast oil spill. But bad weather is coming in and workers are still unable to turn off the flow of 200,000 gallons a day into the water. Comparisons are already being made to the worst such disaster to hit American shores 21 years ago in Alaska. Correspondent Dan Springer looks at what happened then and what's happening now. March 24, 1989, the Exxon Valdez hits a reef, sending 11 million gallons of Alaska crude oil into the Prince William Sound. 1,300 miles of shoreline are impacted, killing thousands of sea otters and birds and destroying a fishery. Today, the sound has largely recovered. Most of the wildlife has returned. Even the fishing town of Cordoba, which was ground zero for the economic devastation, has survived. The herring never did come back, but the fishermen who stayed are still catching halibut and salmon. At the time of the spill, though, there was only despair. In the immediate aftermath of the spill, you know there were people crying in the street. Despite four years and $2 billion spent by Exxon to clean the mess, the oil has proved resilient. Two decades later, there is still an estimated 21,000 gallons of oil just beneath the surface along hundreds of miles of Alaska coastline. They recently completed a study where they dug 9,000 holes and found oil from the Exxon Valdez in half of them. Well, one of the things we expected was it wasn't going to last 20 years, 20 years ago. We expected that oil to be weathered and gone away. Now, some locals are putting their experience to work. Alieska, which runs the pipeline, has sent a consultant and thousands of gallons of dispersant to the growing slick in the Gulf. Mechanical means can be problematic. Uh, and by mechanical, I mean using boom to try to contain the oil. I'm wondering if there's enough boom in the world to contain that much oil. From those who have survived a massive spill, an ominous warning for Louisiana. We have a double whammy. The natural system is going to be damaged, and the economic infrastructure is going to be in chaos. 
Officials now believe oil from the Exxon Valdez spill will still be in the environment here 100 years from now. Other signs are more encouraging. Ten of the 31 species impacted by the spill have fully recovered. Nineteen more are well on their way. From there, the oil travels by truck or by pipeline to a refining facility. Here, the crude oil is melted and molded into pellets that will be smashed, stretched out, and formed into numerous bag shapes. A machine then cuts the bag and prints any words or symbols on it. Working in refineries is another blue-collar job as well. While plant managers and chemists get a six-figure salary, a basic worker could earn from $50,000 to $60,000 per year. Here as well, the risk remains for large-scale fires and injury. Once the bags are formed and printed, they are shipped to a store near you. The facts on the consumption of these bags are that four out of every five bags used in the United States are plastic, which makes up about 100 million bags per year used in the United States. And of the total bags used, only about 12% are recycled and used again. The rest are dumped into the trash and end up in some places you might expect, and many that you might not. The disposal of these bags poses a significant ecological problem for the world at large. They cause flooding by clogging drains and pipes in industrial areas. Bags find their way into animals' food, poisoning the creatures. But above that is the fact that these bags take literally centuries to break down in the wild. Due to this, it is estimated that 60 to 80 percent of the garbage in the ocean today is plastic, a mass the size of Texas. And even when the bags do break down, they turn into small plankton-sized bits eaten by marine wildlife. Because of the mass publicity of these effects, a backlash is growing against plastic bags with the main beneficiary being biodegradable and reusable bags, the latter being the best alternative. Cloth or nylon reusable bags are now being offered in many large grocers as the main alternative to plastic. It is estimated that during the life of the, your cloth bag, a class of 50 would save 50,000 plastic bags from being used and posing a danger to the environment. While bans have been implemented and discussed in many cities around the United States and nations around the world, the real battle looms in the actions of the world's consumers. If a large enough movement can be mobilized against plastic bags, the food and grocery market will move to the more environmentally friendly bags. It's up to all of us to make a difference. To conclude, we hope this presentation has shed some light on an issue that affects all shoppers in the world. And we further hope that this video has inspired all of you to look carefully at your daily decisions and expectedly make more informed and better ones. Thank you.